You're lazy about it. And see how long that lasts for you. It won't last very long. But now you flip the script to where you're the one who's putting forth all the effort. You're the one who's always showing up. You're the one who's always doing all of the talking with no effort giving back in return. And then when you stop completely, you were kicked out of the club. You were thrown to the curb, ostracized and alienated because you quit giving because you were the only one showing any effort in the relationship. It hurt you on the inside, didn't it? How many has been there who's had a relationship like that where you were putting forth every ounce of effort to show any kind of love or any kind of effort in the relationship and then immediately when you stopped, they stopped. They said, well, fine. Okay, if you're not, if you're, I, I, this was easy. But now, now that you've not stopped showing any effort, they're done. They're done with you. And it hurt on the inside, didn't it? How do you think God feels when he puts forth every ounce of effort, where he has done everything and given you everything you need and even so much more, and we can't find time to spend with him? I'm not here to get on you this morning. This is just what God has given me on my heart because I'm preaching to myself right now. I I told myself when God had called me to preach and I started in the ministry, I said, I will never preach a message unless it speaks to me too. So if it's not for anybody else this morning, it's for me today. But how do you think he feels when he's given you everything you need and we can't find time just to talk to Him. Just to say, God, I, I love You. God, I, I, I want to know You, God. After He's already sent Christ, His only Son, to die so that we could have the opportunity of salvation, but yet still the only time we want to go to Him is only when we want something in prayer. Not, not when we need Him, not when we need something from Him, but when we want something. Because we live in a generation where everything is at our fingertips. People get everything that they want and if they don't, they pout and scream and cry until they do. And I'm afraid that that tendency has spilt over into the church as well. Not here, but in some churches. You say, God, I want this car. God, I want this house. God, I, I want this person in my life. God, God, I want this. I want that. You're not going to give it to me? Fine, I'm done with you. Well, you haven't talked to him in six months. He doesn't know you. You don't know him. But the Bible says God will give me the desires of my heart. And I desire this thing in my heart. Well, before that, in that scripture, David says, delight thyself also in the Lord. Because there comes a time in our life as Christians where where we must choose to walk with God, not when we want something, but because of what God has done for us and because of who He is in our life. Not because we're saying, God, He's going to give me this. He's going to give me that. He's going to bless my bank account. He's going to bless me and give me this spouse or this girlfriend or boyfriend or or this car or this house but we walk with God because we love Him and because we know Him and because He saved us and because of what He's done for us and because of who He is in our lives. Hallelujah. Because when you do that and you spend time with Him and you spend time talking with Him and walking with Him and communing with Him your desires in your heart shift from things of this world to the things of God. From wanting, to, from wanting to know what's going on in the world and from wanting, to, from wanting to have things of this world to wanting to know God and to wanting to have more of Him. From wanting to know somebody in the world to wanting to know God in a real intimate way and in a real personal relationship that he desires and and for you to know his voice because when i think about where he's brought me from 
when I think about where he's brought me out of, that horrible pit that I was in and that miry clay that I was in and that, that hog pen that, that my, my choices and my decisions had gotten me into and of how Jesus reached down and said, I can save you. And he pulled me out and rescued me. My desire now is to serve him. My desire now is to, to commune with him and have relationship with him. And to know him and to know his purpose and his plan for my life. And that's what he desires with you this morning. It's for you to, to seek him when you don't want something. To, 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 to have a time that you may just for him and I'm not saying that we can't go to him in prayer when we need him to move because the Bible says to cast all your cares upon him but I personally set aside time where I pray where I say God I'm not coming to you in need of anything today I'm not coming to you asking you for anything. All I'm coming to do today in prayer is to spend time with you. I'm coming to you today in prayer just to want to know you more and want to and to want to know your voice and to have that relation that deep intimate relationship with you, God. Because it's in those times where I have said, God, I'm not asking for anything. I'm not going to pray about one specific detail. That can wait. I want to know you and your voice. And it's in those times where I have been in the woods at Caesars Creek, where I just walk through the woods and seek and spend time with God. It's in those times where those are the days and the moments that God has spoken to me in a real way, more than I have ever experienced in my life, because it shows they're not coming to me with any need they have. I I see the need that they have and it's a great need. I see this is going on. I see that's going on in their life. I see that they have to have me move in this area, but they're not worried about that right now. They're only worried about having relationship with me and to bless them and to show them that I love them and I'm there for them and I want to spend time and have that relationship. I'll move in this area where they need me to move. Because he knows exactly what we need and he loves us. And when we spend time with him and show him that we just want to have a relationship with him, he'll move wherever we need him to move. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Because I, I heard a, a good friend of mine, Brother Jeremiah Collins, another minister, he told a story. He said, he said that back in, back, in the, back in the 1800s, there was a man from England who went out and, and, and I believe it was he came to the States during the gold rush to, to strike it rich. He came out and he, he, he dug and dug and dug and went through the creeks and sifted looking for gold. And then finally, he hit a vein and he struck it rich. And he said, my goodness, I've really, I've hit it big now. I'm, and and his, he, like I said, he struck it rich. And it was back in the 18, early 1800s when slavery was still legal. So he is going through town one day. He's got all of his money. He's cashed in all of his gold. He's got his bag full of money. And he's going through town. And all of a sudden he hears, sold. And he, he, his curiosity strikes him. And he begins to walk over to a large crowd of people. And he stumbles goes on to a slave auction and he looks and sees what's going on and, and these and and men and women are being sold as property and he's from England and, and he, he, he didn't understand he, he's what what in the world is going on and then he understands that they are being sold into slavery and then next thing you know he said they, there's a beautiful beautiful woman who comes up onto the stage and next thing you know her price the price of the auction begins to increase and increase and increase and it gets to a certain certain bid <clears throat> excuse me it gets to a certain bid and people are thinking 
My goodness, it's higher than anybody else has ever, has ever bid. It's higher than any other, any other slave has went for. And the man from England standing there with his giant bag of money yells out a price double of what the bid was at. And then he buys her. They come down. She comes down off of the, off of the platform, walks up to him and says, I hate you. What, why, why in the world are you doing this to me? I, I hate you. I can't stand you. And he grabs her by the hand and he walks down the road and he comes up to this, to this building, a city building, and he goes inside and he's talking to the man in there and he's saying, he's, he's pleading with him. And next thing you know, he opens up his bag of money. And the man looks out at the slave girl, looks back at him and shakes his head and he hands him the bag of money and he hands out and writes out a few papers, comes out and she's still screaming at him. I hate you. Don't, don't get near me. I hate you. And then he hands her these pieces of papers and says, these are your emancipation papers. And she said, what? He said, you don't understand you're free. I bought you and I bought your freedom. You're free to go and do whatever you want. And her statement was, as she began to cry and fall to her knees, she, she, she's saying, you bought me and to set me free? She, 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 she couldn't comprehend it because, see, all she had known was, was hatred and, and, being, and, being, and being ostracized and to be, to be looked at as nothing but property, to being looked at as nothing but somebody who could, who could be bought, looked at as somebody who was less than, looked at as somebody who had no worth. And she said, you bought me to set me free. Now all I want to do is serve you. Well, we as Christians, the Bible says we were bought with a price. But it wasn't any kind of cheap price. And we don't have a cheap salvation this morning. Amen? We do not have a cheap salvation this morning. It wasn't something at a discount store. It wasn't something that came from the clearance rack. But God bankrupt heaven with His Son, Jesus, His only begotten Son, to shed His blood and to die on a cross for your sins and for my sins so that we could be saved and to know God and And not only to know Him, but know His purpose and to serve Him. So that we can make heaven our home one day. But see, the key point of that is to serve Him. Because you see, sometimes I feel as Christians we get saved... And we say, okay, I'm saved now. I'm just going to be, I'm just going to go to church. I'm a Christian. I'm on my way to heaven. But no, we have a job to do as Christians. We serve God. We have a relationship with Him. But in that time where we seek relationship, we have to listen to Him and His voice and see what He would have us to do. Because, see, there's a lost and a dying world out there that needs to know Christ like we know Christ. There's a lost and a dying world out there that is searching for something, but they don't know what it is. And so they try and fill it with the things of this world, with drugs, with alcohol, with relationships with a man or a woman. There's a void in their hearts, and they're trying to fill it. But it's a void that can only be filled with Christ. And it's our job and our duty as Christians to tell them I know what you're searching for because I searched for it too and I found it one day at a church at an altar and his name is Christ Jesus the righteous I found him and I want to tell you about him and I want to show you how to find him hallelujah (coughs) excuse me because no matter any, what anyone in this world may say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It's not a popular thing in the world today to say Jesus is the only way. 
And Jesus is the only thing that can fill that void in the heart of man. It's not, it's not a popular thing nowadays. They say that's the old way. No, no, that is the only way. It's not an old way.